people going around wearing kippers and wearing using ta prayer talents as if that makes them super spiritual. I mean, it's basically a mixture of covenants and takes them back under a law based system. Yeah. And you, you suddenly start seeing they lack love. You know, and, and that really is the evidence that that whole thing is is leading them astray. And then when someone says, well, you must use this Jewish name for Jesus. OK, I understand that J wasn't in the English language until later on and all that. It's, it's irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> to Jesus, he's used the word Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. the father has talked to me about Jesus, his son because they speak to me in my own language mm. you know and if i use i'm not hebrew why would i go back using a hebrew word for jesus mm. you know, or the messiah mm. you know it, so yeah it, it is a difficult one but they become zealots i was just thinking about I've got this friend, well, she's not a close friend, but she, we, we did fellowship for a season. And then she's gone all weird and I've, and she's t saying that you have to say, um, she, well, basically she's saying that she's gone back to Hebrew, keeping the face and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it doesn't bother me, but I'm concerned for her because she's saying that, um, that you have to say, you know, yeah, Hashua and blah, blah, blah. And Jesus Christ is absolutely antichrist. I mean, honestly, I've never heard anything so bizarre. Yeah. But I just think, well, what can I say to her? It's, how do you... <laughs> she won't yeah. listen, honestly. Mm. So I feel really sad for her. And I don't know what to say, really. Because yeah. she was saved by the name of Jesus. That's who she called on. And that's who she was saved by. So now to say that he's not you don't call him that are you basically going to hell or something it's really bizarre it's just, it doesn't make sense to me yeah i mean it it's it seems that when people start to get drawn into deceptive teaching it completely twists their understanding of god and the nature of god is love yeah i mean can you imagine oh someone calls jesus by a different name or they call a hebrew name or whatever and then they're going to hell i mean it's it's ridiculous but that's how deceptive and deep religious programming gets and hebrew roots the hebrew roots movement um is is a deceptive movement as was the judaizers in the first century who were trying to get followers of jesus back to follow the law or come back under the law of moses you know, Jesus warned about the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees, the political and religious spirit. And the Hebrew Roots movement has um, infiltrated the mystic groups. And so a lot of teaching out there is, well, you need to understand Hebrew, you need to Hebrew classes, you need to understand the Hebrew language. Otherwise, you'll never understand God. God is not Hebrew. God yeah. is God. Yeah, that was a language of the people that he chose to engage with and seek for a relationship with as forerunners of his relationship with the rest of the world. And they chose to reject him, <clears throat> you know, but we're supposed to uh, think that Hebrew understanding is the right understanding. You know, all of those Pharisees, lawyers, Sadducees, and all those people who were the high priests who were following Judaism and were following that Hebrew things. Jesus came to reveal were not actually correct <clears throat> and to reveal their understanding with God was completely not correct. <clears throat> so, yeah, when when Jesus came there, they had a completely warped view of who God was, even though the prophets came to reveal God. They still followed their own understanding. Now, part of the problem was when they went into exile in babylon and in the babylonian empire they became synchronistic and so they began to pick up teachings from the culture they were in and incorporate them into their belief system and they did the same later with greek thought and they incorporated it so you have what's called the talmud which is a oral a book recording oral traditions of so-called rabbis that picked up on this 
understanding. Um, and it's such a mixture. Uh, and that became a book that they followed equal to what they called their Torah or their Tanakh. You know, mm -hmm. and actually it's a horrible book. You know, there's stuff in there which which basically gives them permission to to treat other people as inhuman. Anyone who's a goyim, uh, a Gentile, is inhuman, according to that book. You know, and they're allowed to treat them with disrespect. I mean, it's horrible, but it became part of their tradition. And Jesus came into the midst of that to affirm who God really was as a God of love. And the Hebrew roots movement today, and if you look at trace, trace it back to its roots and look at what its goals are, is to get people back under a Hebrew system of law based old covenant thinking. And that will bring them bondage. Now, you just start to see when someone suddenly starts following this, there becomes a lack of love of them. Mm, it's horrible. Operating outside of love, and which is a clue that what they're following is is a teaching which is a deception you know mm. and trying to get us back under the law when we are under grace you know, paul had a very clear perspective to that to the galatians who were a classic group who were infiltrated by judaizers who tried to get them following the law and he said who has bewitched you foolish galatians who has bewitched you you started under grace and now you want to go back under the law you know no one yeah. can keep that was the whole point. You know, it yeah. was a system that all could keep anyway, because it was a part of a man-made religious tradition. You know, Christianity is not Judaism plus Jesus. We've got to understand that Jesus called us to follow him in relationship, simply. You know, that was it. Not a set up a religion, not a set up another religion, but to enter into a new covenant relationship to which he is that new covenant which fulfills all of the old covenants and all of the promises of God and all of the feasts, which were sort of pointing to Jesus. He is now the fulfillment of them. So why people would want to go back following feasts, you know, and following the Jewish new year or the Jewish calendar is a huge deception that many, many people are under and um you know people going around wearing kippers and wearing using ta prayer tallets as if that makes them super spiritual i mean it's basically a mixture of covenants and takes them back under a law-based system yeah. and you, you suddenly start seeing they lack love you know and, and that really is the evidence that that whole thing is is leading them astray and then when someone says well, you must use this Jewish name for Jesus. Okay, I understand that J wasn't in the English language until later on. And all that, it's irrelevant. Yeah. To Jesus, he's used the word Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. the father has talked to me about Jesus, his son, because they speak to me in my own language. Mm. You know, and if I use... I'm not Hebrew. Why would I go back using a Hebrew word for Jesus mm. you know, or the Messiah? Mm -hmm. You know, it, so, yeah, it, it is a difficult one, but they become zealots. Yeah, very much. Often they're mm. so evangelical for mm. their perspective that they become very harsh, intolerant, dogmatic and lacking in love. Mm as if god is going to banish someone for using the wrong name i mean it's really ridiculous but, it is they ridiculous, do. but it's an indoctrination mm. and there is a spirit behind it which is a religious spirit that looks to draw us away from freedom in christ to bondage to a system of following laws and things and the hebrew roots movement itself their whole objective is to get people under the law and there is a uh, group that's trying to get the whole world to come under what's called noahide law um, oh. and get them back into bondage of following a religious system so other than blessing her and you know but you you, you can't argue her out of it because oh, no. um, you'll just get into more and more sort of dogmatic arguments and 
whatever you say will be twisted because there is a blindness to it that keeps people from the simplicity of the truth of God and love. You know, so sadly, many people are being drawn into that, you know, mm. not, not because they're being deceived into it. You know, that's mm. part of it. it's a deception that brings you out of the light of truth and back into a form of bondage, you know. Um, and, you know, and I, I, you know, I get, you know, challenged a lot by people who within the mystic movement who are followers of this type of stuff and the Hebrew letters and all of these things. Um, and, you know, you, but you often find, you know, people who are trying to get you to follow the Hebrew language are offering Hebrew language courses, you know, which you have to pay for. Yeah. You know, there's a financial element to it as well, um, which, you know, we don't need. We truly don't need. At the end of the day, we don't need the Old Testament. You know, why do we need a book written to a people that's not us? Mm. Now, I know there are things in there that the Holy Spirit has used to illustrate the, you know, the things that are Jesus hidden in there. I understand that. But primarily, it confuses people. Definitely. They're mm. writing about a God that they never knew from a perspective that was theirs in a religion that kept mm. them separated from God you know, which was their choice. Therefore, Jesus came as the express image of God to unveil who God really was, you know, mm. to truly reveal the full nature of God. And what did Jesus say? Hey, a new commandment I give unto you. Love one another as I've loved you. You're simple. Yeah. Let's bring it back down to the basics. God is love. He wants us to be loved and therefore find our full identity in that being revealed in love and then express that identity in loving other people, you know. And unfortunately, you know, if you're brought up in any evangelical sense, there will be a mixture of covenants in the as soon as we read the word commandment, we will think law. Mm -hmm. And if you don't fulfill the commandment, punishment. And actually the word commandment, which is in Greek entoli, which comprises of n in and tolo telos which comes from a goal or a result you know it's not a law to follow it actually contains within it a goal that brings you to a result or an end so if you love one another as you've been loved you are fulfilling your identity that is the goal of a fulfilling your identity to it made in the image of god you know, but in English, we read a word which has been translated that and actually properly it means sort of the end result or the consummation. But it's been translated commandment. A lot of things have been translated to give a wrong uh, viewpoint. I feel that a lot. It, does. Yeah. it, is, it is difficult because we have we're mm. following a book. Yeah. Which has translated by people who have an agenda in translating it and a preconceived confirmational bias about how they translate it rather than a relationship with jesus who said he would speak to us mm -hmm. and that we could follow him and we have the holy spirit the spirit of truth who's in us to say we don't need a teacher yeah so yeah why, why are we why are we trying to tell people they need to follow a book when they can be guided by the holy spirit and through jesus who is the truth jesus is the word of god the bible mm. is not the word of god mm. Mm. You know, and that that is the problem we have been taught the bible is the word of god you know and and i hear so many people oh in the word we're going to read the word well no you're reading a book half of which was never intended for you the other half is mostly for people in the first century who were going through a preparation for the end you know and therefore we're not that people therefore we don't need the book now i'm not saying that god hasn't used that he's used it in my life and everything else but it's also caused huge confusion in my life 
and and deceived me into believing things because I was taught that's what the Bible said. Mm -hmm. But actually, if I go with what Jesus said, I'm not going to go by an interpretation of a book. Mm -hmm. I'm going to follow a person in relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible isn't the way, the truth, and the life. Even though it says that verse in there, even if someone had never read that verse or never read the Bible or never even seen a Bible, they can still find the way, the truth and the life in Jesus, who is the door that's open for us to engage the father through. So, you know, I, I would never encourage a new believer to read the Bible because they're going to get confused. Who's so they gonna yeah. read? And whose interpretation are they going to follow? It's going to bring them huge confusion when it seems to be uh, showing two versions of God, you know, yeah. which it doesn't. It was just their view of what God was like, not what he was actually like. Mm. So difficult. And, you know, I don't envy you the task of, you know, trying to change her mind, but you won't. And oh. in a sense, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's not your responsibility to. Mm pray blessing on her you know and look for god to to break through and bring light into that darkness which is shrouding her mind sadly you yeah know. i'm just careful when i send messages to mm. to use not use that terminology because i disagree with where she's going but to be neutral <laughs> if i send a, a message i send a neutral one just to keep in contact yeah it doesn't <laughs> yeah i mean relationship is always the the the, the most important thing yeah. and i can maintain relationship with people i totally fundamentally disagree with because i don't have to prove them wrong and they're not going to challenge what i believe because i believe is my personal experience and testimony you know i'm not following the teaching of a book even though you know i use it because people are a frame you need a frame of reference when that is how they've been taught and framed but in reality you know if i, I can probably think if if i think of how many times jesus or the father has actually quoted me bible verses or taught me from directly from the bible you know it's probably less than four or five times now, when he when they did, it was revelatory, but it was revealing something um, like, for instance, the whole thing of, you know, Jesus said, whoever's weary and heavy laden, come to me and find rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart. Now. That was because I was stuck in being weary and heavy laden, trying to be good enough uh, and keep the behavioral standard so he showed me why i was heavy laden and why i could come to him and find rest because he framed it in that perspective and it was helpful to me mm. you know but i could explain that to someone else without using the verse because it's a principle i learned of yeah. he is the place of rest and i don't strive to work for the place of rest you know, and striving in the context was they were trying to keep the law because he was talking to those who were under the old covenant system when he talked about that in Matthew. You mm. know, now Jesus is quite capable of saying to someone, hey, follow me and come into rest. He doesn't need to say, read Matthew eleven twenty eight or whatever. You know what I mean? He, he doesn't need to. Yeah, that would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. But that's what people expect it to be. I don't know. It's They're obsessed with it. it has to be in the Bible and, and yeah, study the Bible. And oh, gosh. Just I mean, they're afraid of trusting in the relationship they have with God. And I understand, you know, people have gone astray into all different ways. But then yeah. so many people follow the Bible and have gone astray. Look at the cults. And look yeah. at other belief systems. Look at those who led people into mass suicide who were following the Bible. So That's you the can't the Bible will keep you safe when there's masses through history that have used the Bible to persecute people, have used mm -hmm. the Bible to endorse slavery. 
use the Bible to endorse the Inquisition, you know, <laughs> and Christendom. I mean, you know, it's not a safe thing. The Holy Spirit and Jesus as the way, the truth and the life is the only way we're going to walk a path which is a safe path. And if you use love as a plumb line, you're not mm. going to go far wrong. Yeah. Uh, and that that was what will keep us safe. And that's what God said to me. You know, when he when he started challenging my understanding and views of the Bible and the need for it and everything else, he really brought me back to the relationship I had with him and how he spoke to me directly in that relationship and weaned me off my need for bible confirmation yeah i understand a lot of people still do so you have to sort of try and help them understand that how they were told the, that the bible said this and said this and what it meant you know that that needs to be undone in their thinking if they're going to move away from that to follow you know god and they'll quote things like well in the last days there are those who will move away from sound teaching well they did and the last days were you know in in 80 66 to 70 and there were people who were rejecting that through persecution and other reasons you know but it doesn't apply today in the same way you know and i think that's part of the problem you know anyway there we go oh well, yeah i know with yeah, fellowship very yeah, problem yeah. Is afraid of getting deceived yeah yeah sorry julia now carry yeah. on i was just saying people are just afraid of getting deceived and i think they don't trust their own relationship with jesus or the holy spirit because they don't maybe really have a very good connection with him and so if they don't have the bible then what else do they have and so if you don't have the bible then you're going to get led astray but like you said if you're connected with jesus and you don't stray from love if what he's speaking, what you're hearing, what he's asking you to do or inviting you into is it looks like love, then it's probably going to be God. So if yeah. you're af mostly afraid of getting deceived, then you're not going to be willing to step out because you're afraid, oh, what is this isn't from God? It's like, well, if what he's asking you to do looks like love, feels like love, the person will be blessed, you'll be blessed, then what, what else would it be? Mm. The enemy? The enemy doesn't want you blessing or loving people, that's for sure. No, I know. And, you know, it, and when you when you look at how many people have ended up in uh, cults and setting up sex and s streams of pe following people using the Bible, then how can you say the Bible is the safe place? If you follow its teachings, you're going to be OK, because they did. And look where they ended up. I'm um, Jim Jones in Jonestown, you know, in Guyana, who led people into a mass suicide, was using the Bible. You know, most of these things, you know, use the Bible. I mean, 40,000 denominations all using the Bible to prove their point and all having widely different views and beliefs shows that the Bible is totally open to interpretation and can lead people into deception if they're not careful to follow jesus you know and i'm not saying god hasn't used it will he does use it because ultimately sometimes it's the only way he can speak to people but there's a huge filter he has to get through which is why so many people are being deconstructed mm -hmm. yeah because god is having to remove those belief systems which are presenting him in a wrong way and you know, deceiving people into following a religious system rather than the freedom of his grace and love he's having to deconstruct them from that dependence on their safe place in the bible which is not safe you know when i realized how many words were translated wrongly into english which gave me a completely latin view of god the atonement all those sorts of things repentance you know, all of those words which were like, where did that word come from? And how has that word been used over generations to completely cause people to misunderstand what it was that God was wanting to do in our lives? You know, you realize right. that it it's 
not helpful you know and i i remember the story i was told uh, from an argentinian guy who was part of a huge church in buenos aires argentina you know 100,000 people or more and they did a outreach in a region of argentina which was a hard difficult region to reach but they did this big outreach and they saw lots of people respond and then they were going to integrate those people into discipleship groups and give them a bible and everything like that and god spoke to them and said i want you to do nothing with this group for 12 months don't even contact them for 12 months and they were like oh we can't do that you know what will happen to them if they don't have a bible what will they do so but you know thankfully they listened to to that and they didn't so then they went back 12 months later those people were flourishing in their relationship with god you know they didn't need anyone to teach them because god taught them the holy spirit was with them they weren't reading their bible but they were instinctively outworking their relationship with god to one another you know, and, and that challenged their beliefs because they were a very highly organized disciple based group who had this program of how you indoctrinated people effectively to those beliefs. And that was challenging to them. Now, I don't think it stopped them uh, you know, doing what they were doing. So they didn't take it to its conclusion. Well, if they didn't need a Bible, why are we using this Bible all the time for what we do? Um, but it showed that God's quite capable of leading people, of speaking people and communicating with people and helping people to grow in their relationship with him without the need of other people interfering. And doing that, you know, and I, and I think it was, you know, I when I heard that story many years ago, it was like, OK, what would I do in that situation? At that point, I would be struggling not to follow that up, you know um but god was proving a point making a point to them i think so, yeah yeah we've had that um urge as years ago as new believers to give a new believer a bible because we thought oh they have to have the bible and oh gosh how are they going to grow but it's i see now well i've seen for some years it's not like that people are literally worshiping the bible aren't they uh, well it like, can become that way yeah <laughs> yeah we've met a group who literally are yeah it's we have to separate because they just couldn't agree that the foundation for our faith is the lord jesus and not the scriptures they yeah. were that hardcore yeah, yeah. Mm. and it's actually you know what are scriptures you know mm. the word scripture graphe it means writings yeah you know, it's, it's a neutral word it just means writings but we put an s capital s on it and turned it into the bible Mm. all inspired writings are useful of course they are because they're inspired and god has a purpose in in writing and people writing books can be inspired and people writing articles can be inspired you know when that scripture in in 2 timothy three sixteen was written you know you know all scripture is god breathed and useful for you know there was 300 years before they had a bible yeah so all <laughs> inspired writings were useful but it's not up to us to say well we're going to collect those inspired writings and put them in a book and tell people these are the only inspired writings because that's the problem people who say the bible is the word of god they are saying the canon of the bible is fixed and complete therefore god isn't speaking anymore and there is no more inspired writings basically yeah. that's what they're saying by taking that stance well in fact every generation has inspired writings and every generation should have inspired writings which are being written by the people who are listening to god and in being inspired by god in that generation we shouldn't be putting people back to a generation two thousand years ago who had writings we can have writings and relationship with god in every generation and actually find that truth for ourselves in relationship with god and you know and i've said this many times each one of us is an inspired writing and each yeah. one of us is a book a living letter 
that is a testimony to relationship with God. And we can write that down. You know, I've written it down. I've written books that express my testimony of my relationship with God. And for me, I believe those books are inspired by my relationship with God. And therefore, they can be useful. You know, certainly useful for me, if no one else, you know. Um, but I believe everyone has the capacity to write a book of their life that expresses their relationship with God and will be useful to help other people. But I wouldn't want people to be looking at my books in a hundred years time. Cause I believe they will have their own books because God will have moved things forward. And God will have progressively revealed himself in different ways to different cultures going forward <laughs> to which they need their own writings, their own testimony, you know, and each generation can build on the last generation and work in relationship with the last generation, but should have fresh perspective in their generation. Yeah, a friend of mine says, said a few weeks ago, and it was actually very timely, that um, we all, well, we know we ought not to be, everyone was saying, oh, we need to get back to what it was like in the book of Acts and blah, blah, blah. But we're beyond that. We're in the next chapter, aren't we? We're really in the next testament, you might say, after that, the, the one after Acts. <laughs> yeah, because the book of Acts was written in a very specific time period, yeah. you know, which expressed what was going on in their day. Uh, and we're in a different day. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you can read the book of Acts and you'll find all sorts of weird stuff in there, like yeah. Paul making Timothy to be circumcised, you know, like them telling the believers to, to not eat meat sacrificed to idols, you know, and it's like, well, it's meat, you know, <laughs> you know, it's lots of things around that which you can read if you read the book of Acts as a prescription of how to live today, you may find some really good stuff like how they helped each other and they were a community and they shared life together. Great. But the way they did it, we can't go back to living how they lived 2000 years ago. We've got to be living our lives today in the culture we live in, being a counterculture to that. You're not being subject to the conditioning of the culture we live, but expressing how love works within this culture you mm -hmm. know, and how we can express love in our day in our way so that people can experience god as we we demonstrate god's love to them you know, mm. but it is very different from following a set of religious beliefs that are based on a book which was written thousands of years ago and supposedly we're supposed to apply it today and that you get groups of people who still are trying to follow feasts which were for a, another religion you know, it's like, why would I want to take the Passover or celebrate Rosh Hashanah as my new year or whatever those things are? And I'm not an expert on the feast, but I know Jesus was the fulfillment of all those feasts. So we have the living fulfillment to be in relationship with. Why would we try and outwork feasts that were followed in another religion? Mm, you know, and well, I know people, you know, they do it. And I think, I just don't get it. You know, I just don't get why you'd be wanting to follow the feast of Purim or something to do with Esther, you know, and it's like, I've engaged Esther as the cloud of one of the cloud of witnesses. And she's been helpful to give me some insight into the cleansing process that we go through. And, but she was very clear that she told me that she didn't want to be doing the things that she ended up doing. Cause she didn't think that's what God had for her life. You know, and it was like sometimes the very things we do are very contradictory to the things we think we should do, you know. Um, but, yeah, we're in this place where God is unveiling and revealing and deconstructing people's mindsets, belief systems to a very simpler form of love. Mm -hmm. You know, if we love one another, people will begin to see that we are disciples of Jesus and we're following him. Yeah. You know? But we all need to be loved as the motivation and the empowering to love others, not just because we think it's a law we should follow and try. You know, like love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's a law. 
And if we try and fulfill that law, we'll fail. Because mm. we'll try to love God and we we'll try and please him and we'll try and be obedient and we'll think we have to fulfill this stuff. And we will be weary and heavy burdened trying to do it, which is why Jesus tried to get them not to follow the law, but to follow him. Yeah. But people are trying to get people back to follow the law. Yeah. Whichever right. law. And there is evangelical law and charismatic law and reformed law and all the different denominational streams have their own set of laws that they hold to as being the way we should live. Yeah, thank, thank, thank the Lord we're not part of any of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've been there, you know, it's not not, not easy, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, not, no life. Mm -hmm. On that note, uh, I was at a Father Heart school uh, last December, and they quoted one of the guys who does some writing for Father Heart, Stephen Hill, and he said, one of the quotes that really just struck me was, is that any love that you have for God that isn't based in an experience of the love of God is only religious fervor. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, a lot of religious peer people who don't know they're religious people would really not like that quote. It's like, <laughs> no, I love God. It's like, well... How much of the love of God have you actually experienced? And I feel like one of the hardest things to deconstruct in people in, in the in the area that I do ministry here um, is a lot of conservative areas mm -hmm. and just trying to get people to help to realize that they're already righteous and holy, that the blood of Christ has already freed them from their taking their sin nature away, given them the nature of Christ, and they are righteous and holy. Like I, I was talking about this the other night. And like, no one's like giving any reaction because you can sense the internal struggle. Like, I really want that to be true. But my experience is not that I'm righteous and holy. My experience is that I'm a hypocrite and I'm a sinner. And it's like, well, are you taking your nature and identity from your experience? Or are you going to look at the Bible and what the, what the Lord has said about you, that you are made righteous, you are holy, you have the righteousness of Christ. Is that going to be your identity? Or are you going to get your identity from your experience and it's mm -hmm. like well we don't do that with god if, if we want our theology based on our experience which a lot of people actually do god is not going to be loving and and faithful and all these things and good and it's like well how are we so inconsistent in how we get our theology and our identity of god and how we get our identity of ourselves like why is there that disconnect and it's mm -hmm. so hard to see get people to see that you're righteous and you're holy and when yeah. you live out of that identity, then you will begin to look a lot more righteous and holy. No, absolutely so, yeah. And I think so many people are conditioned into a sin consciousness. Yep. So they're conditioned into, they still think they live in Adam. And therefore they're sinners who are saved by grace, therefore, but they're still sinners. Therefore they're identifying with a old thing. No one's in Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. We're in the last Adam, but we're not in the first Adam anymore because we're a new creation in Christ. And therefore, we don't need to operate from that lost identity. You know, and all the things that people in lost identity do to try and find the, who their identity is. All the works mm -hmm. they get involved in trying to find, well, who am I? And most people identify who they are with what they do. But God is wanting to reveal our true identity in relationship. So we look into him and we see ourselves reflected back as his children in that way. And so it's a relational outworking of identity. Yeah, we can believe what the Bible says about us, but I can believe I'm righteous. But until God reveals to me what that righteousness is in my relationship with him, it just becomes sort of a doctrinal statement, you know, and I need to know the truth by personal experience of the truth. What does it mean to be righteous? I am the righteousness of God in Christ. What does that mean? Well, my whole mindset needs to be framed by the reality of who God says I am. Mm -hmm. And then I can operate from who I really am rather than trying to be that person. And so many people even when you tell them they're righteous, they still strive to try and prove their righteousness by what they do. Mm -hmm. 
And if I never did anything, I'd still be righteous because it's God who's made me righteous, not me doing something to make me righteous, which is works. You know, and how many people are stuck in works because they don't understand the free nature of what Jesus has done for us that we can embrace rather than earning something by some form of religious duty or even my beliefs. My beliefs don't save me. My beliefs are in the fact that I'm saved. <laughs> it's like, it's true whether I believe it or not. My belief doesn't make it true. But when I realize it's true, I then believe in that reality. And then we can live out of that reality we believe, you know, but I've experienced it. You know, it's like faith. We've taught people they need to have faith in God. And therefore that faith is, well, you're never going to meet God until you die. So you just got to have faith in him while you live. And it's like, you don't need faith in someone you've met. And we're supposed to have a relationship with God in which we meet him and engage him and know him. I don't need faith in my kids to believe that they're my kids. I know they're my kids. You know, I have a relationship with that in that sense. So in a sense, it's like, OK. We've taught people to have a faith about God, which restricts us from the relationship. Just have faith. Just believe. Well, how much faith do you need? Well, only a little bit. You know, only a mustard seed of faith, but it's your faith that actually determines what happens. Well, actually, when you read what Paul said to the Ephesians, we're saved by grace through faith, and that's not our own. It's not our faith that has saved us or our faith that makes something happen. Now, I know how to use faith to create something because it is the evidence of things not seen, but I've seen God. So I don't need faith in God because I've seen him. I know him. I have a relationship with him. But I do use faith as a how do I create this thing? Well, I call it as if it is, if you like. So God called things that be not as if they are. He created things by calling them into being when they didn't exist. So faith is the evidence of what you've seen in your mind, which is not yet fully realized in reality until it realizes but once it's realized i don't need faith in it anymore and i think some people are still stuck in faith trying to believe in god trying to hard to believe enough in god that 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 amount of belief will be good enough for them and they're stuck in this bondage of fear of not being good enough and not having enough faith you know and you get so many people who then Point that as the evidence. Well, look at your life. You can't have enough faith, you know, and then it becomes a, a bondage on people. You need more faith. You know, you got to you got to believe harder, you know, and actually it's his belief in me. I live by the faith of the son of God, not in the son of God. So my faith in the son of God hasn't saved me. His faith in me has saved me. You know, his belief in me is what's important, you know, and it's a huge issue for a lot of people, sadly, you know, because we've lived by a religious system. Which has promoted certain things, which has caught us up into a religious belief rather than a relationship, you know, and our relationship with God, we can trust um well yeah this is the last that last point you said um again i just don't think a lot of people trust that they actually have a real relationship with the lord and mm -hmm. so i think that's the difficult part for them um but on a different note i wanted to ask you um what do you think about like the baptism of the holy spirit um i've had a lot of people a lot of people talk about their radical encounters when they get baptized by the holy spirit and then they begin mm -hmm. operating in a lot of the gifts of the spirit things like that uh for myself um i've never had like a dramatic encounter and mm -hmm. so even when i've talked to people about not having a dramatic encounter sometimes 
like I've had one pastor said, well, then what spirit are you doing things by what spirit? And I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure by the Holy Spirit, because everything I'm doing is pretty loving. And so um, I was wondering what your perspective of that, because I've, I've walked in like pretty much all the, the gifts of the spirit, um, you know, now and then. Uh, and so I don't know, what do you think, what's your take on like dramatic, um, enc dramatic encounters? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, diff it's a difficult one because I think God wants us to have experiences of him, obviously. Yeah, and I have experiences of him yeah. every day, not like yeah. super dramatic like that. Yeah. Um, I think ultimately the gifts of the Spirit were designed for the early church who needed those gifts until the end of the old system happened. And I think the context, when it talks about until you know the real has come, um, now, you know, people will say, well, that's the Bible. Well, no, it's not the Bible. It was Jesus who came to fulfill what he promised and bring us into the new covenant to which as we mature, we don't need gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. Our spirit is able to do everything that the Holy, because we're one spirit with him. So I think they are, well, they're described as childish things. We use them when we're children because we've not yet matured so that our spirit can do those things that the Holy Spirit gifts us to do and inspires us to see that for ourselves. You know, so I have no problem in thinking, well, I, I don't use gifts of the spirit in that the Holy, now the Holy Spirit can give me a gift if he wants, you know, totally his prerogative to give me a gift. But when you're mature, like an adult, you don't give a toy to, that a three-year-old child would use. You might give them boys' toys or adult toys, but you don't give them toys like that. And those things are, if you are mature, you don't need the toys anymore. So I don't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for the mature, but they certainly can help you come to a place where you are mature. Um, but the baptism of the Spirit, ultimately... Again, we're looking at the things that happen in the Bible to see that there are several parts to salvation. Well, actually, I don't believe there are. I think we should encourage everyone to receive everything when they discover that they are already included in what Jesus did. And their experience of that inclusion should include the fullness of the spirit of being able to hear God and all those things in it. Now, you know, but personal testimony is that we've all been brought up in this sort of, well, you get saved, you then go on a baptism course that will teach you about baptism. Then you'll get baptized in water. And then when you're a bit more mature, then you may get baptized in the spirit. And then you know, you'll get spiritual gifts and all of that. Um, and I think they've separated everything up into something which lessens the experience of actually entering into that relationship with God that's already yours, that you're discovered. And I think I understand why. But when you read the early church history, they got baptized on the day of Pentecost. They baptized them straight away. They didn't like, oh, we're going to go on a baptism course. Because baptism didn't mean to them what we have now taught the church it means. They were coming out of an old system. They were literally dying to the old system and coming into a new one. Well, most people today don't have that. So baptism in that sense is not quite the same as it meant for them. And we've all been baptized into Christ. We were baptized into his death, resurrection and ascension. So when it says go into the world and baptize, you know, into, you know, in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit, that was for the spreading of the gospel until Jesus came and ended that system. And, and I don't think actually it's necessary today. I know people say, oh, well, it's one of the sacraments being baptized in water. Well, I'm baptized into Christ. You know, and water could be a symbol of that. But I've been baptized in Christ, irrelevant whether I went in the water, because it happened when Jesus died. 
I died with him. When Jesus was buried, I was buried with him. When Jesus was resurrected, I was when Jesus ascended, I was ascended with him. So I'm now seated with Christ in heavenly places. All of that needs to become my experience. Other than it being sort of true, but I don't know it. But I don't think the way we've taught it is actually relevant for today. I think we should be encouraged in people to enter into a relationship with God where the fullness of that relationship is revealed to them and they experience everything they need. But there will obviously be an ongoing renewing of their minds to more because you can't get everything in, a, in one sense, all in one go, that you'll understand it all. But I do believe it's all part of what has already been accomplished for us. So, you know, I would not baptize people today, although I would not against people if they want to get baptized because they want to demonstrate the fact that this has already happened to them and they want to say this is the sign of that. That's fine if they'd like to do that. But I don't think it's necessary. And I think that when the Bible was saying that, it was saying that in a different context, which was bringing people out of a religious system, which they needed to identify in following Jesus. That was really what they were doing. They were no longer following Judaism. They were following Jesus. And of course, they were no longer following, you know, and you could say, well, people may today be following a cultural thing and that might be something they want to do to say i'm leaving this world behind or whatever in that sense so i'm not saying people can't get baptized if they like to i just don't think it's what the bible said for today because i think if we fully knew that we were baptized into jesus's death we died and are now resurrected and now we're a new creation in christ we wouldn't need any physical outwork out symbol of it we would be living in that knowledge because we will have experienced that in our relationship with God, you know, and I died with him. So I'm resurrected with him. So I'm living a resurrection life, you know, which, and all of that means, you know, is way more than, you know, the symbol of baptism. You know, I got baptized when I was about 16, 17, because I saw it in the Bible and I wasn't, sort of in a church that baptized anybody they did christening and then i joined another church that they didn't baptize people anyway so i thought well the bible says being baptized so i need to go and find someone to baptize me and i did and i went and found a church that did baptisms and they got they baptized me i can't say it made any difference <laughs> to be honest when i look back did was there a radical change in my life following that not really you know, and I did get baptized in the spirit later on in my life because I had no experience of the spirit or of that relationship with God. So God was showing me that you can receive more and there is more to this relationship than you currently have. And so when I got baptized, it was quite a radical change, but that was because I was broken inside. You know, I didn't have an emotional connection to God. I didn't have a relationship that was intimate in any shape or form. So when I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit, it opened up a whole different ball game to my relationship with God. But I could have I could have felt that the day I discovered that relationship in God and then I wouldn't have needed it later on. But, you know, I was born into my time, into my experience, which was none. So the experiences came later, but I believe everyone can have that in their relationship with God fully in the beginning. They don't need to see, well, now I need to get baptized in water because I'm ready for it. Now I'm ready for baptism in the spirit later on when I'm more mature. Hey, why don't get everything that's part of salvation now, including healing and everything? Why, why do we want to wait for a later experience? So personally, when people thought, well, I don't speak in tongues, so... I can't have been baptized in the spirit. Well, is the Holy Spirit in you? Do you have a relationship with God in the spirit? Yeah. Well, then what does it matter? You know, and do you pray from your spirit? Well, yeah. Well, then you are praying in tongues then. You know, your tongue just happens to be English. 
or whatever your first language is, you know, because you're not praying with your mind. So where is it coming from? From your spirit, which is where tongues came, you know, and the gift of tongues for me was a real confirmation because that experience I had no real clue to it. And I was looking for tongues as the evidence that something had happened to me. And God blessed me with that. And there's nothing wrong in praying in a language that your spirit can use. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you need the now you're going to have this amazing thing to be able to do that. I think anyone could do that. But my question would be, well, why do you need to? You know, if you're inspired to pray from inside, then, you know, it doesn't need to be in another language. You know, my, I must admit that most sort of tongues that came in church services, you know, were not tongues. They weren't, they were, they were all interpreted wrongly because they were all interpreted as prophecies that God was speaking to us through a tongue. No, tongues are me speaking to God. Never God speaking to me. Why would God speak to me in a language I can't understand? Now, often people's cries out to God in the spirit was responded to in a prophecy. And that's what some people picked up on. And they prophesied God's response to what this tongue was crying out for. You know, but actually 99% of the time, I've I don't think I've ever heard a tongue interpreted correctly because it's always God speaking to us but I've heard you know most of the time I've occasionally it was more of the person actually sharing a deep call to God and, and when someone interpreted that it was like yeah but most of the time I'm like nah that's that's not the interpretation that's just God's response which is okay also but it wasn't really what the person said. And to be honest, you know, it confuses people to be honest, most of the time. So it's like, hey, if you're going to prophesy, just prophesy. You know? Yeah. Don't see many point in doing it like blah, blah, blah. And then in English, does it? Might as well just do it the once. <laughs> if yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, in the early in the early church, it came from an Old Testament thing of that God would speak in foreign tongues, mm. would speak to them in foreign tongues. And of course, on the day of Pentecost, they all heard God in their own languages because mm. they were all there on the day of Pentecost. Then were under all the nations of heaven, it says, were there. So they all heard God speak to them. And I think, what did they hear him say? I think he said, will you marry me? Because he was basically coming back to the previous generation failed to come into this marriage relationship. Will you marry me? Because now you have the spirit with you to inspire you to live in this relationship with me. And I think they all probably cried out in their spirit. Yes, we will. You know, they probably responded from a deep cry in the inside to yes, we will. You know, um, but, you know, it's one of those things I wouldn't get hard and fast about it. You know, if people have an experience, great. And sometimes God gives people experiences because they need them. But I wouldn't teach it as a you must now look to be baptized in water and then you're going to be baptized in the spirit and then you're going to exercise spiritual gifts. And then you might become a fivefold ministry or whatever, because it's seen as a sort of progression of maturity, if you like, in which I think there's a better way in growing in our relationship with God, recognizing everything that's already been done and living in the good of it, you know, and then it becomes something of a badge of honor. If you're in the Pentecostal church, if you don't speak in tongues, well, you're not, you're not really in, you know, and then it can become a striving and a desperation. Or oh, I need to, you know, I remember my mum, who who wanted to speak in tongues and she was so so tense she just couldn't do it you know until you know i had to try and get her to relax she was so like oh it's so much what it god you know you know and, and in the end it was like it did happen for her but when she backed off 
and didn't desperately try and strive for it, then actually it happened. You know, and I know people are almost conditioned into, well, you need this, otherwise you're not mature, you know. Um, and I don't think it's necessary in the way that, you know, years ago I would have said, okay, I learned a lot through praying in tongues and learning how to do more than one thing at a time by praying in the spirit and thinking in my mind or praying out loud and, you know, all of that stuff. It, it was helpful on my journey, but I, think that was just my journey where i came from because i've come from a background that didn't believe in spiritual gifts that came that actually was the the beginning of cessationalism you know and there are no spiritual gifts it was all for the early church well i have sympathy for it now in one sense in that there was a reason for it in the early church which isn't the same for today but god can do whatever he wants whenever he wants you know, if he wants to give someone a gift, great, he'll do it, you know, because um, he's God. And I wouldn't want to put God in a box and say, God can't do that today because it was only for them. Well, of course he can do it today because he's done it in me. I experienced it today. It was a genuine experience. It did change my life. But I wouldn't be teaching people to have that same experience today. I would want them to have an encounter with God at the point of realizing how much God loves them, which will change their lives and give them all that they need because the Holy Spirit is already in them. It's relationship with the Holy Spirit, which can be actually when you're looking for gifts, you're looking for something to happen as a gift rather than a relationship. And people get caught up with the gifts rather than the giver of the gifts and some people are more interested in the gifts than the spirit himself you know and actually it's the relationship with the holy spirit which is important uh, and the most important you know. yeah but you know i know a lot of people obviously if they're coming from charismatic pentecostal backgrounds they would be horrified to say well we don't need the baptism of the spirit like that today you know, I'm not saying we are not baptized in the spirit. I'm just saying the outworking of it is that all of us have been baptized in the spirit. And there is an outworking of that in our lives because we all died in, in Jesus and we're all alive now in Jesus. You know, we were dead in Adam and now we're alive in Christ. So there's this all sorts of dynamics around baptism and what it was when it happened are we partakers of it? And I think we are all partakers of it because Jesus was our full representative in we died when he died. We were buried when he was buried. We were resurrected and we were ascended. And therefore it's all there available. Mm. Yeah. But God will use whatever he can to touch people. And if they're expecting something, you know, then he'd rather give them something of an experience whether the theology is correct or not is not really god's not a, a beholder to i have to stick to this correct theology you know yeah yeah i think as you're talking just making a lot of people seem like they make their own experience not just descriptive but prescriptive for other people as well yeah. and i was thinking as you're talking well even with me like my relationship with other people is different like some people have a certain relationship with me and other people have a different kind of relationship with me than god God has different relationship with different people. And so he knows what they need when they need it. And so why would we expect what he's done with us to be the exact same way he would do it with another person? I think that's Absolutely. probably. Yeah. yeah. I, I totally agree with you there. I just think that we have, because the way in which the Christian world has operated, we operate on expectations of certain things in certain orders. And I realized that actually my understanding of that was completely warped. And therefore, God will work in that because that's the expectation and he wants to touch people. But it doesn't mean that the theology is right just because God does what they expect him to do. He also does what he, we are not expecting him to do. And he does it in whatever way he chooses to do it with everybody. I think if we fully help people encounter God at the beginning in relationship and experience, 
they wouldn't need all these extras added on to them during their Christian life. There just would be an ongoing, continual journey of relationship, you know, rather than these series of events we're looking for. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.